Um, the topic for tonight is Wi-Fi in schools. And uh, when we uh, read what's recently come out uh, in the international media, you know, April 23rd, for example, out of the UK, a danger on the airwaves. It's the Wi-Fi revolution, a health time bomb. It talks about, uh, you know, in every uh, coffee shop and every school being Wi-Fi access and what this is doing to our health. Uh, scientists demanding inquiry over Wi-Fi. The research hasn't been done. We cannot assume that wireless networks have no effects. Another headline from The Independent on Sunday. So there's a dramatic uh, public uh, uproar right now occurring about this concept of Wi-Fi in schools. Uh, the first question I would like to start with is, what is your take on the usage of Wi-Fi in schools, and what do you see uh, before we uh, jump into major details, what do you see kind of on a 30,000-foot uh, bird's-eye view level uh, being the key issues as it relates to Wi-Fi usage in schools? Well, Alfred, the first thing is is that, you know, we understand now so well what the mechanism of harm is from the information-carrying radio waves. And Wi-Fi, of course, uh, emits uh, information-carrying radio waves so that we, we have the same a broad range of health concerns with Wi-Fi that we do with uh, cell phones and other types of wireless technology. The, uh, the most uh, interesting opportunity with the Wi-Fi problem is this, is that with cell phones and uh, cell phone base stations, those are two areas that the FCC in the United States uh, has jurisdiction over, and two areas where the Food and Drug Administration gave the cell phone industry a variance or um, uh, a pass in terms of requiring pre-market testing. So cell phones were not pre-market tested uh, prior to going into commerce, and neither were uh, wireless base stations. However, Wi-Fi is a different uh, type of um, issue because neither the FCC nor the FDA have taken jurisdiction over Wi-Fi. So that we, we really uh, are in a situation where uh, if uh, uh, parents in schools and if other concerned parties make a stand, uh, there is no regulatory authority that uh, uh, will keep uh, Wi-Fi from being tested. We made a huge mistake with cell phones by not testing them prior to market. Uh, we don't have to make the same mistake with Wi-Fi, uh, although right now it seems as though uh, around the world uh, most uh, schools are going in that direction. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the conditions that uh, we are suspecting or that we're seeing uh, as a result of this wireless blanketing of many high school, university, and, and junior high school campuses across North America and the world. Uh, when we first talked about this topic a few weeks ago, uh, you mentioned uh, you know, disruption of brainwave profiles. Uh, I remember a study coming out of Europe not too long ago that showed that cell phone usage, for example, uh, has a residual effect on the brainwave profile of children in particular. But can you comment a little bit on uh, some of the learning ability issues and cognitive deficits that we may be seeing uh, due to wireless exposure uh, 24 hours a day? Uh, yes, Alfred. You know, the, the fundamental mechanism here is the disruption of intercellular communication. The information carrying radio waves cause uh, the cell membrane to close down so that active transport channels are not permeable and you have uh, the cell becoming nutrient uh, deficient, energy deficient, and the cells are not able to talk to surrounding cells. Now, if you uh, ex uh, take a closer look at that mechanism, that means that nerve cells, for example, are not able to talk to each other the way that they're uh, supposed to be, and that has a direct impact on cognition our uh, ability to learn, uh, young people's ability to learn, young people's ability to focus. And uh, indeed, there are now uh, a number of studies that have been done uh, in, uh, in laboratory animals that show that these information-carrying radio waves uh, indeed uh, impact uh, the ability to learn, the ability to retain information. And um, uh, in interestingly, there are now uh, studies that show that uh, behavioral problems uh, in children in schools are related to Wi-Fi. 
meaning that you have uh, not only cognition problems but also uh, disciplinary problems and uh, other issues that are a direct result of of the synapses not uh, not working the way they should in these in these young people. And uh, that is where we are so concerned because we're looking at a, a fundamental disruption of physiologic process. But when it comes to young people in school, uh, we are talking about uh, the future of our society. And we already know that with young people, uh, they are more susceptible to the uh, types of damage that we know uh, come from the information carrying radio waves. And, and the reason for that is simple, that up until about the age of 18 to 20, uh, biological tissues, cells, are uh, differentiating more than they are proliferating. In other words, they are uh, changing, exposing a lot of uh, DNA uh, more than they are growing. That's why if you look at a picture of, of yourself, uh, for example, when you were 12 years old uh, and compare, compare it to a picture when you were 14 year, years old, you'll see a difference in the profile, a difference in the, the way the person looks. And that is because the cells are differentiating. They're changing as the child goes through uh, its match, his or her maturation process. And when you have cells that are differentiating more than they're proliferating, that means there's more exposed DNA. That means there's more opportunity for interference with DNA repair. And uh, that is what actually puts these young people at far greater risk uh, of health effects uh, learning problems, sleep disorders, behavioral disorders, uh, all the way to autism, uh, higher risk across the board. And, and that is why it is a tragedy in the making with uh, uh, schools all around, the, all around the world bringing in Wi-Fi and actually convincing the parents that this is uh, an advance that this is something that is good. A school with Wi-Fi is better than a school without Wi-Fi, uh, and uh, it, is, it is absolutely a tragedy. Well, you know, it's very interesting, Dr. Carlo, that when listening to these different conditions that you're pointing out and the different uh, kind of domino effects that we're seeing, that internationally this has really received uh, a lot of exposure already and a lot of discussion. You know, for example, in uh, Great Britain, um, Dr. Professor Laurie Chalice says that the mobile, um, whole mobile phone and wireless industry could turn out to be the cigarette of the 21st century. I mean, how poignant is that? Um, in uh, Professor Lee Salford of Lund University uh, is deeply worried about Wi-Fi's additional um, electro-smog. And uh, in Austria, my home country, the Medical Association is lobbying against the deployment of Wi-Fi in schools because the authorities of the province of Salzburg, for example, have already advised schools not to install it, and they're now considering an entire ban. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gerd Oberfeld, Salzburg's head of environmental health and medicine, says that the Wi-Fi is dangerous to sensitive people, and the number of people in the danger are both growing. So it's very interesting to see that countries, uh, especially in Central Europe, have really picked up on this topic already, and I remember reading recently that a Canadian university has taken a stance against this already, and they've basically banned Wi-Fi access uh, from the university campus. Now, the question that I had for you was, you know, knowing that we're exposed to so many stressors already, I mean, there is air pollution, uh, there is water pollution, there is toxicity in food, uh, there's a tremendous amount of stress already on us. Would you say that electropollution being one of those spokes on the wheel or the Wi-Fi um, access that we all on one hand enjoy but on the other hand is that additional stressor that, that kind of may tip the scales for us from a stress perspective and from a, a human toxicity perspective that, you know, that is what puts us over the edge? Is that possible? Well, Alfred, I think it's worse than that. Uh, because, you see, all of those other stressors, all of those uh, environmental exposures, uh, we're able to develop compensations for those. Our immune system is able to respond to them, uh, and our nervous system is able to respond to them. But what we have here with the Wi-Fi and the damage from the information-carrying radio waves is that our immune system becomes compromised. 
So if uh, the information carrying radio waves, the Wi-Fi type of exposure, is more serious than one of the spokes in the wheel because it makes these young children more susceptible to all of those other stressors, all of those other exposures. And to make matters worse, uh, Alfred, is that we have now, in the Safe Wireless Initiative, been doing testing uh, in schools uh, uh, around, around the world. We, we have Safe Wireless Initiative uh, branches now in, um, in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, uh, in, uh, in Canada, also in uh, Channel Island of Jersey. Uh, and when we look at the amounts of information carrying radio waves, in those schools, it is interesting that because of the construction of most of these schools, you know, schools have an interesting construction because it's public public uh, construction. Usually, it's uh, less expensive construction. There's a lot of metal. Uh, there are a lot of metal walls, and what happens is that. The information carrying radio waves, the dangerous waves, become trapped in the schools. The schools actually become resonant cavities. So the exposures in the schools from Wi-Fi are, are greater because those information carrying radio waves cannot get out. So, so not only are we talking about a fundamental disruption of the immune system that makes these young people more susceptible, we are also talking about an environment that concentrates the dangerous radio waves, and it underscores once again how tragic a mistake this is for us to be putting Wi-Fi in schools across the world. Well, I, what I find very interesting about this discussion, Dr. Carlo, is uh, when not only when looking at the angle of the students, but also looking at the angle from the teachers and the professors. Because, um, you know, these are individuals that um, are highly regarded, many of them, uh, that are very educated and that um, have a huge responsibility on grooming our kids and our teenagers. And they spend oftentimes more time with our kids and teenagers than the parents do. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, I know we talked about kids and teenagers, but also from the aspect of a teacher, meaning an adult being exposed for an extended period of time to this uh, information carrying rate of waste and to that type of stressor. You know, what do you think uh, from a behavioral pattern perspective, from a focus pattern perspective, uh, what can we expect there? What, what do you anticipate happening to these individuals that have such a large responsibility to educate our youth? Well, I mean, you know, a couple of things uh, come to mind, uh, Alfred. The first is that uh, most of these teachers are, are in these schools uh, for many, many, many years so that uh, while the children uh, will move through a middle school, for example, in three years or through a high school in four years um, and certainly be exposed during that time, the teachers sometimes are there for 25, 30, 40 years. So that you're talking about now looking at a chronic exposure to something that is very, very dangerous. Uh, and we actually have been talking to uh, many representatives of teachers' unions because this is the kind of thing that, uh, that moves into the workers' compensation uh, area. Uh, it, uh, when you have chronic exposure to these information-carrying radio waves, we're, we're not only talking about uh, an inability to focus and uh, you know, temp uh, tempers may be becoming a lot more uh, uh, prevalent, you know, uh, teachers losing patients. All of those are things that we would expect based on the exposure, but more seriously, uh, we would expect things like brain tumors and uh, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, those types of chronic conditions. So the first thing uh, is you're, you, know, you, you really are talking about an occupational hazard that uh, up until this point has not even been recognized. Uh, and then the, the other thing uh, is that um, you, know, you, are, you are talking about uh, a profession that requires uh, the ability to, to learn, uh, the ability for uh, high levels of cognition, and uh, the ability for um, uh, very, very good communication skills. And what we would expect to be seeing here uh, are our teachers losing their ability to, uh, to have patients to uh, have that cognition because of the disruption of inter, uh, intercellular communication. 
so, so all of these, all of these items are are very, very important from not only the student's perspective but also from the teacher's perspective. And uh, I, I, I will say that on May 21st. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, Panorama, which is the, the United Kingdom's uh, version of 60 Minutes or 2020, is going to have a very, very provocative uh, one-hour documentary special on Wi-Fi in schools. And that will be May 21st. And uh, the listeners should be able to pick that up uh, on, the, on the Internet. And what's important is that I know uh, I have par participated in this uh, uh, documentary, and they will be covering all of these angles: the teacher angle, the the student angle, uh, the the fact that many of the conditions that we would expect from the information carrying radio waves: difficulty sleeping, unexplained anxiety, you know, difficulties in focus. Those are those are. Uh, symptoms that most people would not even recognize as symptoms. So that what they're what they're going to be focusing on in this documentary is the need to shock people into paying attention. Uh, so I would in encourage people to mark their calendars. Uh, this is going to be a very very important uh, very very important program. Uh, and Alfred, back to your earlier point. You know, it's interesting that something like this comes out of Europe. It uh, doesn't come out of the United States. Uh, you know, we have had, for example, many, uh, many opportunities in the Safe Wireless Initiative to work with schools. And invariably, invariably, every time there is somebody on the school board who is tied to uh, one of the cell phone companies uh, on the board of trustees of private schools, and the next thing you know, uh, the whole effort is shut down. So uh, this is uh, one of the problems uh, in the United States that they don't have in Europe is that the, um, the power of the, of the industry to uh, effect their will on the system is much greater here. Uh, we seem to be much more responsive here to uh, monetary pressures, and uh, that is why uh, something uh, like this very important program on Wi-Fi will uh, come out of Europe first uh, before the United States. Uh, Dr. Kahl, I wanted to ask you uh, another question, um, and that's the tie-in of some of these conditions you mentioned, you know, ADD, ADHD, some of the issues that um, we feel are correlated to or contributed to by electropollution, and to some extent at least, and pharmaceutical drugs and what's being prescribed, especially to kids and teenagers in schools today. Uh, can you shed a little bit of light as what your theory is um, of the correlation between the two and, and how electropollution really plays a major role or may play a, a major role in uh, how these conditions are treated and how people go about it? Uh, sure, Alfred. And, and you know, you, you again, you know, hit the nail on the head. One of the difficulties is that you know, for the past five to seven years, uh, and of course that is the time frame when uh, we have the most dramatic increase in wireless uh, technology use and background exposure to information carrying radio waves. You know, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this to folks before that it took 20 years for the first billion cell phone users. So by the end of 2004, we had our first billion. 18 months later, we had the second billion. And 12 months later, we had the third billion. So uh, you know, we are looking at an exponential uh, curve in terms of the increase of exposure to these information carrying radio waves, most of this in the last four or five years. When you read the educational literature, the, the uh, pediatric literature, the medical studies that are, are published in those journals, uh, folks are talking about uh, an increase in conditions like ADHD, uh, hyperactive disorders, learning problems, and what's happening is is that the conventional medical uh, community, uh, you know, the, they treat these kids with antidepressants and Ritalin and those types of pharmaceutical interventions, uh, and most of the time they tag these kids as having some type of inherited behavioral disorder, uh, and they they put the blame on the parents and they put the blame on the kids. And uh, we look at this uh, much differently because we know that when intercellular communication is disrupted, the 
pathology that ensues is the baseline or the basic pathology for attention deficit hyperactive disorder, for learning problems, difficulty focusing, and that these uh, conditions should not be treated with, uh, with pharmaceuticals. These kids should not be on drugs. The parents should not be blamed for the, for the circumstance. And uh, we find that uh, this is one of those areas where when uh, we are able to talk about the cause, the information carrying radio waves being the cause, uh, parents uh, uh, first, first they breathe a sigh of relief and say, my God, I'm, I'm glad it's not me. I'm glad it wasn't me. Uh, and I'm also glad it's not my son or it's not my, my, my daughter. So uh, as uh, folks are out there talking to people in schools and talking to parent-teacher groups and to um, uh, other school um, society groups, teachers groups, uh, don't be afraid at all to point out that we are over-medicating our children and that the information-carrying radio waves are indeed related to these uh, types of uh, conditions and that we can, uh, we can prevent them. These conditions are preventable. It means they're unnecessary. Uh, we don't need to have our children suffer. We don't need to have our teachers suffer. There is a way to fix this uh, without medication and, as I say, without blaming the parents and without blaming the children. Um, Dr. Carla, looking into the future, what do you see as it relates to electrosensitivity? If the current, um, the current tendency of entire cities, entire counties, entire regions, even entire countries going wireless. Um, and uh, so, in other words, even individuals that choose not to use, let's say, a cell phone or cordless phone, or choose not to have a wireless router in the home, uh, inadvertently we are exposed, whether we like it or not. What do you see happening uh, with electric hypersensitivity levels? Uh, you know, right now the World Health Organization estimates that only three or four percent of the world's population has a condition called electrohypersensitivity, but the reason that makes me question that statistic, and I think it's way underestimated, is the fact that many people don't even realize what they are feeling is related to electropollution to a great extent. So what's, what does the future hold from an epidemiology perspective for EHS or electrohypersensitivity uh, when the tendency is to blanket the globe with wireless access? Well, the, the term uh, electro hypersensitivity in and of itself uh, underestimates the uh, condition. The the condition that you're that you're speaking of probably occurs three to four times uh, a higher uh, incidence than two to three percent. It's probably more like ten to twelve percent. Uh, that condition, the electro hypersensitivity, uh, is one of a number of conditions that are uh, uh, under a syndrome that we call membrane sensitivity syndrome. And membrane sensitivity syndrome is the cell membrane pathology that uh, occurs uh, uh, after uh, someone has chronic exposure to these information-carrying radio waves. And it is a very debilitating condition. Uh, this is not something that is uh, trivial. People who have membrane sensitivity syndrome, uh, the electro uh, sensitivity variety of membrane sensitivity syndrome, they are debilitated. Uh, if they're in a room where there's Wi-Fi or if they're in a room where somebody turns on a cell phone, they have to leave. They have an autoimmune response. Uh, they become nauseous. Uh, some of them pass out. Uh, when they go home, uh, uh, they have uh, very, very severe t stomach problems. Uh, many of them bleed. They end up having blood in their stool. They're not able to work. Uh, their, uh, their spouses uh, uh, wear out. Uh, many of them, uh, their marriages break up. They have difficulty with their relationships with their children. It is an extremely debilitating condition that is uh, afflicting, uh, we believe, almost in the double-digit percent of the population. The other thing that happens here is that uh, in the 1980s and 90s, there was a, a, a new condition called uh, multiple chemical sensitivities and multiple chemical sensitivities is membrane sensitivity syndrome that is induced by chemicals. So you have a whole group of people out there who suffer from multiple chemical sensitivities, and what we are finding is that everyone who has m multiple chemical sensitivities also has electrohypersensitivity. 
so that you, what, what's happened here is that the information carrying radio waves trigger the adverse uh, immune responses in these people who are already afflicted with the uh, exposure from the, from the chemicals. So uh, we are very, very concerned. You know, as, as you, you may remember, we, we run a registry in the Safe Wireless Initiative uh, where we, we gather data uh, with people who have these types of symptoms, and we study that. Uh, we are opening up registries now in Canada and England and Ireland and other places around the world because no one else is counting. That is the tragedy here. Uh, we in the Safe Wireless Initiative have the only registry in the world that is tracking what happens to people who are exposed to these information-carrying radio waves and our um, assessment, uh, our fear here is that uh, this has moved from a, uh, a health risk issue to a medical problem for so, so many people. And uh, that is uh, another reason why uh, we think it's so, so important that we are able to uh, intervene with these young children in schools, uh, with the school boards uh, and the parents in these schools because that is going to be the best place to make progress because there is no regulatory authority who will interfere. When we look at cell phones, the FDA and the FCC, they interfere with our ability to protect people. And when we look at base stations and towers, the FCC and the other regulatory authorities interfere because they're being pressured by the industry. With Wi-Fi in schools, there is no opportunity for interference because there is no regula regulatory authority who has taken jurisdictions.